Okay, so my name is Sunny. It's in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, work, I work at Grasshopper of Asia, uh, it's a high frequency trading firm, so I think investments are smaller skills, right? Um, so I'm a software engineer with them, currently I'm building um, JavaScript powered platforms for traders to make quick trades. Okay, so um, before I move forward, so today I'll be talking to you about protobuf, uh, protocol buffers. It's a way of serializing data when you want to send across the wire. But before I get that, I think that there's, uh, I like this, this concept of meta learning where in the subject that you're gonna learn, there are some other nuances that you can pick up. And one of that is, uh, in this, today's meta learning would be, there's no best, okay? When I talk to you about protocol buffers, most of you might think, oh, this might be the best thing, or this might not be the best thing, JSON might be the best thing, right? Um, that's not the case because you always have to approach it in a very um, objective manner. So when you wanna decide whether you wanna use this, you find out what your requirements are, and then match it against benchmark what your current status is, match it against what's happening, and then decide whether you wanna move forward with it. In this case, you're talking about protocol buffers, you're talking about transmission of data over a network or storage. So you would be, oh, what's my file size? Or how fast does this transmit? Those questions need to be answered first, yeah? So moving forward. Um, okay, so it's a way, protocol buffers, uh, it's by Google. It's a way of serializing data for storage or for transmission over a network. Yeah? Um, the way it does this is that it converts into binary format and then it streams across whatever platforms you have. <coughs> um, one of the very common other ways is JSON and XML. I'm sure most of you know about it, right? Uh, how many of you know about protocol buffers? Fantastic, nice, okay. Yeah, so we've been using this quite uh, extensively at, our, at my firm. Um, so, like I said, it's by the guys at Google. Uh, they've been working on it quite extensively as well. It's an open source project. Um, the next few things is it's platform agnostic, meaning I could have a Node.js server or a Go server talking to a Android device or a Swift, uh, a iOS device, right? So you can transmit data um, in a very fixed format over the network. And it, deserialization and serialization, everybody knows what that is, right? Anybody does not? Okay, uh, happens through various APIs that they have available in multiple different languages. So you can talk about Python, JavaScript, C++, uh, Ruby, right? So now that you know what protocol buffers are, let's try and take a look at what it is, what it looks like. Okay, um, so to get started, right, you would need to have three things. One is generated, two are required. So first you have your proto.file. Think of it as your schema, right? Uh, if you look at it carefully, it's quite easy to understand, right? Uh, syntax just means that I'm using protobuf version three. Yeah, and then here I'm de describing an enum to say that there are three types of uh, phone numbers, right? Um, and then everything is a message, as you can see, right? And for example, the phone number, I would like to say that the string, a number is a string and I'll tag it to one. Now this is why protobufs are very, very powerful because they do not collect metadata like JSON does, right? They identify via this number here, right? So converting into bytes would be a lot more faster. You can compress data and make it more dense as you transmit over the wire, yeah? Um, you can also have collections in the same struct where you say it's a repeated field, so I can have multiple phone numbers called phone, and I'll tag it to four. I will not go in, into depth uh, about the technicalities. You can easily read them up. For me, it's just to tell you more about what this is. Yeah? Okay, so next, once you have your proto file, you'd have a compiler, right? It's called the protoc C. Um, what we do with that is to say, here's my proto file. I need it to be compatible on my C++ platform. Right, so it compiles, it outputs an API that you can use to access, to deserialize and serialize uh, data that you want to transmit over the network, yeah? So other generated APIs include like C++, C Sharp, Ruby, Python. The one I have here is our JavaScript um, output format. So as you can see, for phone number, you can set the number or you can get it. Right, the, the API is a lot more extensive than this. It's a lot more powerful. I'm just giving you a, a small snippet of it, yeah? Okay, so what happens is that usually you would have one copy of this 
you'd compile out two versions in, and then put it on each server or client that you have, right? Um, and now I'll explain more about some of the nuances that you might want to observe. Okay, um, there are, so because of the other API formats, you, you don't need to worry about whether your platform is on one language or one platform. Uh, all of that does not matter. Next, this is a bit complex, so I will try and take it slow. Okay, so the workflow is this. Let's say you have a Go service and you want to transmit stuff to a client further down the line, right? One of the things is that your Go service will call an API, the Go API, which will then serialize it into whatever format. Points for whoever can figure out what that is. Um, and then it transmits over the wire, okay? Hits whatever Node.js server or any other microservice that you might have. And this is where protobufs are more, most powerful, right? This packing that they do here uh, is very dense in the sense that it's a small file transmitted quickly over the network. Yeah, so a microservices architecture would best benefit from this. And I'll tell you more about when it does not benefit. Lah. Okay, so Node.js server gets it, calls the API, deserializes into JavaScript objects, does what it needs to do, serializes it into JSON, and then transmits to the client. So some of you might be thinking, you know, this is very inefficient. You're like converting from one format to another. Like I said, um, only when you have microservices architectures, then this would matter to you, yeah? Okay, um, so now, now that you know what the flow is like, I'm gonna quickly move on to my most important things. Do not use it if, okay? One, your data is directly consumed by the browser. JavaScript is fantastic, our browsers are very powerful, right? So do not use it if you're talking to a browser because browsers use JSON very well, they're optimized, right? So stick with JSON, yeah? Okay, uh, next is JavaScript. Like I said, la, it's, if it's your architecture is largely JavaScript, JSON is already the best thing you can do. Native binding is, is very powerful in, in JavaScript and in your browsers. Next, um, your large packet sizes. So Protobuf excels in a very specific um, file size. If you hit above one MB, then you need to rethink your architecture, right? If you're transmitting more than one MB of data per, per packet. Um, and if it's below 300 KB, then when you gzip your JSON versus your protobuf, right, they're almost the same. So the packing is, 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 is something that you need to think about. Yeah? A lot of people will show you benchmarks will be like, oh, you know, JSON is far faster or protobuf is far faster. Um, that is their scenario, no, it's not yours. So remember, the only thing I would like you all to take away from this is follow your own context first and then do your test. Um, so yeah, large packet sizes. The, this is also very important. Young startups, some of you might have your own projects that you're working on, you want to be in a business. Uh, do not use ProBuff. Okay, do not waste time in trying to implement it because JSON will get your job done quickly. You want to understand your data structure, you want to understand how you use it, where are the less optimal areas, identify those things, and then when you look at scaling, you will do it. So the meta learning here is premature optimization is stupid. Yeah? So remember that. Okay, so when should I use it? Okay, wait, uh. Okay. yes, if you have a Node.js server that's talking to native Android apps or Swift apps, because you're no longer using the browser, right? So parsing JSON, uh, JSON files might not be as optimal as you might like it to be, but ProBuff is quite, quite optimal in that sense, yeah? So it might be a good idea if, if you have a Node.js server that's talking to a, some application outside of the browser. Um, yes, microservice architecture spanning multiple languages. So that's the case in my firm, right? We've got, very, we've got various languages all talking to one another. Our output is on a, on a browser. So in between each service, the communication protocol is Prova. Yeah? Um, so things like Prova performance is far better on Java platforms, <coughs> right? Uh, as compared to JSON performance. So if you're building for a Java output, your client, then you might want to look at that. And this also helps us because having a strict schema uh, prevents a lot of you know, um, stupid behavior when someone decides to typecast into something else and sends it over the wire to you. Yeah? So you might want to, it might help you in that sense. 
and high data throughput. So this is where it's interesting because remember how previously I said if you have a largely JavaScript architecture, do not do it. This is the only exclusion that you might have if you have high data throughput. Because compared to XML and JSON files, XML is strictly, uh, protobuf is about three to 10 times smaller and about 20 to 100 times faster in transmission. So it might make sense, right? If you are a company moving at scale, you're making a lot of calls, or you are using WebSockets to send packets over consistently, then you might want to look into it. Yeah? But always test first if you're safe. Because um, some we tried using uh, protobufs, gzip versus JSON gzip. Difference about 30 KB. Doesn't matter unless you move at a very large scale. Yeah? So that's about it. Any, so that, that's my presentation. So I hope it helps you all understand a bit more. Um, if there's one thing that I wanted you all to take away from that, was to figure out, yeah, that's all my slides. Um, yeah, was that uh, there's no best. Try and do a contextual test first before you move forward. Any questions? Uh, yes. Correct. Okay. So for us, in, in, our, in my form, we are talking about maybe hundreds of thousands of packets of information coming through the wire. So when I say high throughput, I'm talking about a lot of package, packets coming in and moving out, right? Size, yeah. Because if, you're, if you have high throughput plus large packet sizes, then there might be something wrong with the architecture, right? So you need to rethink that, cut it down to smaller pieces, and send them more frequently. Then you might want to use uh, pro buffs. Um, but if you have no choice, then do not use ProBuff because it's not as optimal as you want it to be. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. You need the same proto file to be yeah. the time in the server, right? Okay. If you have, let's say, a version of the mm. protocol. Correct. How do you handle it? Okay. So one of the interesting things, I didn't discuss this, uh, was the version control in ProtoBuff. Um, as if, let me just come back to the slides. Uh, so this tagging, right? One thing is that there's backward compatibility in here. So I could say that I have a new type, or let's say a new way of describing emails, right? I could easily put email new and then put four. So services that require normal emails, they could access this. And services that do not require can just skip through it and then parse the other ones, right? That's one. So that's version controlling. Uh, it has some capabilities in there. Um, if you talk about changes in schema, right? Uh, for us, the way we maintain it is that we have uh, we keep this in one repository, and always when there's a change, we recompile to get it out there. Uh, this does not need to recite in the server. This can recite outside of the server. This is what needs to recite in your servers um, for it to work. So this is an input of sorts hits the compiler, compiler generates this for you to use it on your server to serialize and deserialize. But you need the same version on both the clients. Correct, correct. Um, so if you have the same version, you, you will definitely need the same version uh, as with uh, JSON even, right? Uh, when you deserialize, you are looking at whether the fields are all the same, right? And then the moment it hits something that it does not recognize, it throws you an error. So yes, you will need the same versions on both ends. Technically, it's one because it's only one input file, right? So it's only one master copy that you modify, but you recompile into various APIs that might have the updated copies. Yeah, I hope it answers your question. It's just that it makes it more complicated. Correct, correct. If you have a, you know, a mass deployment as well. So correct. Uh, so th that's, that's why I, I, I would advise people who do not really have a very distributed architecture to use this. Right, uh, do not try and do this because it's a lot more harder to maintain. Right, but uh, the moment you move at scale, this might be worth the, sh the effort that you have uh, in, in terms of cost saving in bandwidth and speed. Yeah, anything else? We have time for another question if anyone wants to ask. So, who, who has used protobufs? Okay, uh, can hear you from them. Uh, I have a question. <laughs> What's the biggest problem you faced? Um, the serialization time. Right, okay. Uh, I used 
put on a browser for a game. Uh -huh. um, and we use a lot of CPU to deserialize. I needed to put it in the web worker. Correct. So as you can see, like I said, right? Um, do not use this in a, as, a, as a transmission protocol to hit your browsers. Always keep it in your servers, right? And, and hence the, the, the suggested architecture where you want to deserialize in your servers and then push it out as JSONs because JavaScript very well, you know, does it very well. The uh, parses JSON objects very well. Yeah? Anybody else has I issues that they want to highlight about protobuf? Okay. So that is about it. Cool. Thank you.